In a previous video, we saw that if you take a pure semiconductor and add group 15 elements like nitrogen, phosphorus, we took phosphorus as an example, then because of five valence electron, one extra electron compared to silicon, at room temperature, these phosphorus atoms end up donating those extra electrons and our entire semiconductor now has a lot more electrons, a lot more negative charge carriers compared to holes. And as a result, we ended up with what we called N-type semiconductor. And in this video, we're gonna find out what's gonna happen if we add group 13 elements. We'll take, um, uh, we'll take boron as an example. And remember, usually we only add group 13 and group 15 elements for making our semiconductors impure. And we're gonna speak a little bit about, again, why that is true towards the end of the video. And uh, the process and the stuff that's going to happen when we add boron or any other element over here is going to be identical very similar to what happens when we add group 15 elements. So it'll be much easier to follow and it'll be much easier, you, you can even predict what's going to happen beforehand if you have followed those previous videos. So if you have not seen them or if you, if you need a refresher, then it'll be a great idea to go back and watch those videos first and then come back over here. So anyways, let's add boron to the party. Now, if you write the electronic configuration of boron, you will see that it has three valence electrons. We can quickly write and check that, confirm that. So uh, since boron has five electrons, its electronic configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, four done, one more would be 2p1. So notice that its valence electrons are just three. Oops. And so if you add boron to the semiconductor, a pure intrinsic semiconductor, and the way of adding that is again really complicated, we'll not get into that, then some of the electrons, some of the silicon atoms could be replaced by boron atoms, or at some places there won't be silicon atoms. We call them as crystal defect, no crystal is perfect. So at some places there will be vacant sites, so boron can just go and swoop in and fit over there. So we just assume that one of the, uh, boron is just going to replace one of our silicon. So let's remove one silicon atom, and fit our boron into the mix over here. As the boron fits over here, notice, because it has three valence electrons, it can nicely form covalent bonds with three neighboring silicon atoms. So these atoms are pretty happy. They don't care who it is because they have filled up their octet structure. But you can see that this silicon is not happy because it's not filled its octet structure. And the reason is there isn't one electron over here. It would have been great to have an electron. So you know what? This silicon desperately needs one electron over here. So there is a vacant site for an electron, which is not occupied by anyone, and it's desperate for an electron. The question is, what's going to happen? Can any electron from here swoop in over here? Can it do that? Well, again, we have to be careful. We need to look now at the energy level of this vacant site produced by boron. So let's get rid of this videotic table and let's bring back our band diagram. We've been using that a lot. This would be the band diagram at very low temperature of an intrinsic semiconductor. But now the moment we add boron, we were interested in what is the energy level of this site. Well, it turns out again, if you do the math, then that energy level is found to be very close to the top of the valency band. Can you see how this is beneficial for us? So what will happen at room temperature? If we were to get this all the way to room temperature, then one effect we've already seen in pure semiconductor that's gonna happen here as well, there will be thermal generation. Some of the electrons will gain thermal energy and jump into the conduction band. But notice, since there's another energy available over here, some of the electrons can even jump from here to here. Does that make sense? Because this energy gap is incredibly small. It's much smaller than this energy gap. It's much easier for electrons to jump over here. In fact, what's going to happen is that almost all these vacant sites will now be completely filled by some or the other electrons. And as a result, all those will be filled up by some of the other electrons, and when they jump, they would leave behind a lot of holes. So over here, if we were to see it, we could imagine, say, this electron has jumped from here to here. Any electron can go like that. Anyone in the neighborhood can do that. And as a result, notice it has left behind a hole, and this hole now is in the valency band. It is free to move. So notice by adding our group 13 element, like boron, we have now produced lots and lots of holes. Again, let's write that down. So this is the summary of the entire thing. Group 
13 elements. If you add group 13 elements, then we end up with lot more holes, lot more holes than electron. And so, because now the majority charge carriers, the majority of conduction is done by holes which act like positive charges. Remember that? They're not positive charge, they're not even particles really, but they act like positive charge in the, uh, in the sense that if you apply an electric field, holes appear to move in the same direction. So since you have a lot of positive type charge carriers, we call this as P-type semiconductor, P for positive. So we call this as P-type. And so whenever someone says P-type, what comes to my mind? That P is telling me there are a lot more positive type Positive type means holes, so a lot more holes, NH, number of holes is way, way larger than number of electrons. Number of electrons. And that's pretty much it. We just have a couple of names, technical names that we use uh, when it comes to adding impurities. The process of adding impurity is called doping. And since this boron, it accepted an electron, and that's how we got holes, we call this impurity as an acceptor impurity. Right, we also call this as, group 13 are called as acceptors. Acceptor impurities are just acceptors. And the level, um, the energy level that they had, the, uh, at which the electrons were able to jump into, that energy level that Boron introduced is called the acceptor level. So it's called acceptor, acceptor level. And now we could ask a big question. Why are we only adding group 13 elements? I mean, if we bring back our periodic table, if we bring back our periodic table, I mean, group 13 elements is fine, but why not add group 12 elements? Say like, I don't know, zinc maybe, because if you work out its electronic configuration, you will see it has just two valence electrons. You can just check that. And so if we added zinc maybe, then it has only two valence electrons and it will have two vacant sites. Yay, more electrons can occupy, right? No, it doesn't work that way. What's important is to look at that acceptor level. It turns out that if you add group 12 elements or any other group elements, the acceptor level will just go higher and higher and higher. What's the point of having multiple vacant sites, a lot of vacant sites, if your acceptor level is so high? Because then it'll be extremely difficult for these electrons to jump from here to here. It'll take a lot more energy. And so most of those will not be occupied by the electrons at room temperature. And so it'll hold the whole thing will be pointless. And that's the real reason why we only add group 13 elements. Uh, because in group 13 elements, it turns out that the acceptor levels of all these elements, almost, almost all these elements, the acceptor levels are very close to the top of the valency band. And that, that, that's really the key to to understanding why, that, that's the key to why we add 13, group 13 elements. So lastly, one big misconception that we might have, because I always had that, is that now that we have a lot of holes, a lot more holes compared to electrons, isn't this like a positively charged semiconductor? Is, uh, because also it's, it says P-type, right? I always used to think P-type, positive type. I always had in mind, P-type means positive semiconductor. Well, we have to be careful. Again, if you think about it, we start with a neutral, pure semiconductor, all silicon atoms were neutral, and we added neutral boron. So how can the whole thing be charged? The whole thing is still neutral. But then what we need to understand is that although we have had this extra holes that you might think that might contribute to positive charge, remember when the boron accepted an electron, the boron ended up becoming negative. So all those extra electro, uh, holes that we have gotten, their charge can be balanced if you compare, uh, if you realize that the boron, all the acceptor impurities now have a negative charge. So it has become an ion. And as a result, the whole thing is still pretty neutral, all right? But now the big question is, is this what we wanted? Remember, our, we want something that only conducts in one direction. Can it do that? Well, let's find out. So if we go down, I have the whole thing ready over here. So this is how we usually depict a P-type semiconductor. We're gonna show, we're gonna ignore all the silicon atoms, only show these boron ions. Notice, since it's an acceptor, it accepted electrons and it became negative. But as a result of accepting those, we now have a lot of holes that can freely move, majority are holes. And we also have some electron and hole pair form due to thermal generation. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, what a P-type semiconductor, we, we would like to show it this way. And now, does it conduct only in one direction? The answer is no. 
<laughs> because if you apply electric field to the right, almost all the holes will just go to the right. If you apply electric field to the left, the holes will just move to the left. So all we have done is improved the conducting property of our pure semiconductor, but it still doesn't have any directional property. So if you look at it that way, it's still pretty useless. So a P-type semiconductor just all by itself is still pretty useless. We have to do something more to make it useful. And we'll do that in future videos.